For lecture nine in comparative genomics, I'm gonna be talking about transcriptomics today. Uh, and hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll have a better understanding of the difference between uh, genomic and transcriptomic data. Um, you'll also understand the differences and relationships between microarrays and RNA-seq. You'll know what a gene expression table is and how it's derived. Uh, understand how transcriptomics can be applied to study the changing gene expression and recognize how transcriptomics can be used to work out the genes and proteins responsible for specific phenotypic features. So if we think about uh, what a is, transcriptome is, it's the identity and quantity, quantity, basically the inventory, of the entire population of RNA expressed from the genome in a cell. Um, we also, you might have also might have heard of the term proteome, right? And proteome refers to a similar uh, definition, but for proteins. So the identity and quantity of proteins expressed from the entire genome in a cell. Unlike the genome, the transcriptome and proteome can vary dramatically from one cell to another. So, you know, every cell has the same, essentially has the same genome. Obviously, some are lacking nuclei, for instance, that might be different. Um, but everyone has the same genome in every cell. But the genes that are expressed and the proteins that are made can vary dramatically. Transcriptomics has been widely applied in a, in a wide range of genomic associated fields uh, in order to measure the identities and the relative amounts of RNAs in a population of cells, um, and also to look at differences and similarities in gene expression. Over here, we have an example of how we might, where transcriptomics comes into play. So what happens is when we're in these different types of situations, right? We have different things that can affect which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. Uh, and all of these things uh, culminate in uh, what we refer to as phenotypic variation, right? So genetic variation can lead to um, certain genes being expressed and other genes not being expressed among individuals. Um, epigenetic uh, variation, so changes in the environment or heritable genetic changes, parent of origin effects, things like that can also have an effect on transcription. Um, we can see uh, patterns of adaptation um, and uh, uh, responses to ecological systems being very dependent upon these patterns of um, transcription. And, you know, responses to environmental change is another important thing controlling this um, transcription, uh, these transcriptional patterns in various tissues and organisms. And I think the key thing to, to notice here is that in this diagram, right, we have phenotypic variation. Phenotypic variation can be lots of different things, but trans, transcriptome and gene, gene expression is actually a manifestation of that phenotypic variation, right? So that's kind of at the crux of this thing. So it allows us to get an insight into actually what is the phenotype of the organism um, without necessarily knowing what its genotype is. When we think about how transcriptomics is, a, transcriptomics is accomplished, uh, historically it would have been accomplished with um, something called a microarray, which was a chip like this. Um, what you see on these chips is that it's basically just a ton of different oligonucleotides attached in this area here. And we know the position of all these oligonucleotides. They, tat, they, they code for very specific targets. And what we would do is we would um, use these positions and, and a, a series of fluorescent washes with different types of um, probes to basically um, identify which genes are active in different types of samples. RNA-seq is uh, the more frequently applied approach uh, in transcriptomics. And in this case, uh, we're looking at um, sequencing of RNA molecules. Uh, by converting them to cDNA. And this is largely the way that we do transcriptomics, um, where we take an RNA sample, we convert it to complementary DNA, and then we sequence, we throw some adapters on the ends of that, and then we sequence it on a, on a system like the Illumina HiSeq. Um, there are ways to also do direct RNA sequencing, so direct sequencing of RNA without the cDNA uh, uh, set. And um, Oxford Nanopore has been developing um, these types of technologies on their MinIon sequencers. Uh, 
A big assumption across all these methods, though, is that there is often an underlying assumption that transcription is indicative of some other broader pattern associated with phenotype. So in this case, protein expression patterns relative to patterns of cor uh, uh, corresponding mRNA expression are, are thought to be related to each other. Um, that is not always the case. Uh, transcript transcriptomes and trans gene expression may not have a very strong direct relationship with the amount of protein or the activity of a or inefficiency of a protein in a given sample. Um, so we have to be careful about how we're actually interpreting transcriptomes relative to what a phenotype is. Um, some of the big differences between microarrays and RNA-seq um, one for microRNAs, right, we have this chip that has probes on it. You actually have to choose which probes are going to be used on those microarrays. So that's going to uh, present a certain amount of um, biased approach to that, right? So some of it is going to, um, some of your analysis will be driven by what you already know about the system. Whereas RNA-seq, uh, there's also some issues with microRNAs where they can sometimes compress the range of gene expression that can be detectable. And RNA-seq can, can provide uh, a more precise measurement of RNA actual concentrations. Um, and the other thing that RNA-seq can do is it doesn't, you don't necess necessarily have to choose which probes you're gonna target with RNA-seq, it's kind of um, target agnostic. Another uh, thing with microarrays is that um, you kind of have to have a microarray that's built for the organism that you're working on, um, whereas RNA-seq you could you could apply to any sample. Uh, so when we think about how technologically these work, um, microarrays, um, gen we can use microarrays for other types of technology, but typically we would use them either to analyze mRNA sequence, mRNA expression, or to detect DNA sequence uh, variants. Um, so if you think about like 23andMe and companies like that, they're typically using sort of these large DNA variant microarrays to do their, their DNA quote unquote sequencing of you. Um, but in this case, we'd use them the same sort of probe system for um, uh, detecting gene expression. And basically what it is, is it's a highly paralyzed hybridization experiment. Um, and so what happens is you have this chip with all of these oligos attached to it. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to look and see if um, uh, you have all of these oligos and you're going to see how much of your unknown sample is going to bind to it. Historically, we actually did RNA expression doing things like these one-to-one -one experiments. Like we would do, uh, you know, an oligo binding to a very specific sequence or an oligo binding to um, an unknown sequence. This is historically how we do northerns or southerns. Um, but for microarrays, we have a lot of oligos binding to an unknown sequence. And when I say a lot, I mean up to maybe about like 5 million or so different ol oligo probes, right? And each position of those um, uh, equates to a specific oligo probe prayer, pair. Right. Um, on average, there's usually about like 16 to 20 probe pairs per mRNA. And the way that this system works, as I said, it's it's got a sort of a compressed range. Um, so it's we consider it to be quantitative, but maybe only semi quantitative. Um, so uh, typically what happens in, in a micro experiment, right, you have your sample, you have your control, which you isolate mRNA from, and then you're gonna tag each one of your samples with some sort of fluorescent dye, either a red or a green dye. Then you're gonna take your samples and you're gonna wash them across your chip, and you're gonna hybridize your samples to those oligos that are on your chi chip. And in that process, you know, if you have a lot of green at one site, um, it will bind to that probe. If you have a lot of red, it'll bind to those probes. And if you have a lot of both, they'll both kind of cancel each other out. In the end, you end up with a fluorescence pattern that looks like this, where yellow means sort of expression in both tissues, black means no expression, green means expression in your control, and red means expression in your sample. And by doing this, we can look and see what are the patterns of upregulation and downregulation relative to the treatment of your sample. 
Um, microarrays are generally used for this type of contextual gene expression profile. Um, they can be applied to this type of transcriptomic approach can be applied to a wide range of different questions. Um, microarrays work in this way, but also uh, RNA-seq can work in this way too. But questions such as cellular states and process, uh, um, comparisons among related species of similar samples, so you know, comparing like liver tissue of different samples, uh, diagnosis of genetic disease, genetic warning signals, precision diagnosis of disease, um, drug selection, determination of gene function, target selection for drug design, pathogen resistance, and temporal variation in gene expression. Basically anything where transcriptome would be informative, you could use a microarray for. Um, and as I said before, you know, you can use these things in genomics and proteomics as well. There are applications for them. Often the data that you would get historically from something like a microarray and also from an, an RNA-seq analysis would be something we might refer to as a gene expression table. And this is some sort of presentation of the relative expression levels of different items uh, that you were looking at, different targets. Um, and typically you would be comparing something like expression patterns from two or multiple sources. Um, and what you would, so in this case here we have um, uh, uh, um, gene expression from, say, a female and a male zygote across a range of different genes, right? In, in this case, each row indicates a biological replicate um, of these two categories of samples, whereas sorry, each column represents a biological replicate of these two samples, and each row indicates a different gene um, that was examined in this gene expression process. Um, and what you can see is some really distinct differences, right? Um, and those distinct differences are often um, shown using this kind of hierarchical clustering and branching pattern to show which groups belong together. And we see, you know, the male and the female zygotes clustering off together. We also see that there are certain genes that are down-regulated in, um, in the female zygote and up-regulated in the male zygote, and other ones that are down upregulated in the female zygote and down-regulated in the male zygote. And we can see them indicated by these different colors here on the y-axis. Um, typically, these values are um, going to be normalized by row, right, where the expression of um, these samples is shown relative to the other, sam other, sam other genes, uh, sample genes in this row, um, not by column, but sometimes it's done by column. So in this way, we're able to see some pretty clear patterns in how samples might be distinguishable from each other. And so this type of heat map um, is commonly used in transcriptomics. What about uh, some other technologies? Well, RNA-seq is probably the most commonly used methods for transcriptomics. Um, it's basically whole transcriptome shotgun sequencing. Um, the process involved in it, uh, well, the goal of this is to quantify what RNA is present in the sample. One of the big benefits of this method is that it's hypothesis free. So whatever you're sequencing is what you get. You don't need to know ahead of time. You don't need to know what genes you need to put on your chip. You can just have your hypoth you can just take your samples and sequence them. And you may see differences that you didn't expect. So there's a certain amount of discovery science that's involved in um, RNA-seq that you might not get for, with other types of inquiry types. Basically, the process by which it works is you use a reverse transcriptase to take your um, RNA sample and double-strand it and create a complementary DNA, DNA product from this mRNA. Um, a lot of times uh, when we think about these things, right, we're thinking, oh, yeah, when I look at this RNA and this gene expression, that's going to translate to some sort of protein product. Um, but that isn't necessarily the case. So if we think about what is actually transcribed, right, about 85 percent of the genome is transcribed, but only three percent of it codes for protein. So if you're just looking at your total RNA fraction, um, you're going to get a lot of stuff that isn't protein coding. Um, 
So uh, one of the goals of this is that you do have to possibly do some selection up here at the beginning in this wet phase where you're selecting either for mRNA or you're selecting away from other types of RNA. So for instance, uh, often um, when we do RNA-seq, we're, we're either going to pull down all the mRNA or we're gonna pull down all the ribosomal RNA because especially in, in, in eukaryotes um, and uh, things like vertebrates, you know, anywhere between like 95 to 99% of the, of the RNA that you isolate when you do a total RNA extraction is going to be ribosomal RNA. And if you just sequence that sample, you would just get a whole bunch of ribosomal RNA. You'd never know anything. Only 1% of your sample would be your mRNA and the stuff you're really interested in knowing about expression. So there does have to be a certain amount of targeting that comes into this process. There are also other parts of the RNA fraction that we might want to target besides the mRNA. Um, so, you know, when you think about what's transcribed, there are lots of different components. So we might want to identify specific exp uh, gene expression patterns associated with other types of questions like microRNAs. So we would have to do some size selection. Um, and then there are ways we could target other sort of uh, unique aspects of transcription that we might not uh, be able to look at otherwise if we weren't using RNA-seq. Things like uh, alternative splicing and fusion genes and RNA editing, right? And so by doing uh, RNA-seq, it allows us to have like a certain amount of discovery into these other processes. Um, so one of the things that happens is after we build the cDNA, um, most sequencers can't sequence an entire CD, full-length cDNA. So we have to fragment it. Uh, we fragment it pieces, put adapters on the end, then we sequence it. Then we have to take these fragments and we map them to a reference genome. And what happens is um, by mapping them, we'll end up with pieces on different exons. And the patterns of these mappings will help us draw connections between different exons. So here we can see these reads load up on these different parts of the genome, but because there are these reads that are connected to each other, these paired end reads, um, that either, or maybe some reads that are splitting this, uh, in, this intronic region. So half of it is in the exon here and half of it is in the exon here. We can start to draw connections between different sections of coding sequence. Um, and then one of the other really powerful things about RNA-seq is it not only gives us a representation of what is there, it tells us how much is there. So it's a quantitative analysis, which is incredibly powerful. So we can not only use it to see what is in a sample, but how much it's being expressed. Um, now, as I mentioned before, there is still a lot of discussion about how correlated our, uh, this gene expression data is with um, protein expression, but still it's a very useful tool regardless of that. Um, so after we generate our RNA reads, we'll then align them to our genome. Notice that like you'll have a certain read that will be split. Um, across multiple introns. So you can start to identify different patterns of um, alternative splicing and maybe actually deduce how many splice products we have in our mRNAs. This is one of, being one of the big contributors of RNA-seq to our understanding about uh, transcription. Um, we can um, use them, uh, the, you know, these sequences are typically relatively short um, and so we do end up with sort of small fragments of them. Um, but these types of mapping can, read, can lead to, to very interesting patterns. And typically um, you'll see them displayed something like this when we look at um, like something like UCS Genome Browser and, and the tracks associated with it. So this will, these high peaks show where lots of reads have mapped back to the genome and can help um, show us you know, where the uh, um, uh, exons are of this organism. Uh, when we look at the gene expression piece, um, basically we often quantify uh, RNA-seq data using a range of different measurements, things like RPKM, FPKM, TPM, 
Um, these stand for normalized uh, measurements of gene expression, either reads per kilobase per million reads, or fragments per kilobase per million reads, or transcripts per million reads. Um, and what this indicates, right, is like these are the number of items that map to a specific target corrected for some factor that could lead to bias in the mapping rate of that target. So one, we divide by the number of reads in a sample. So not every sequencing sample is the same amount. So if I was to look at two genes and I only sequenced 10 million reads and I had um, 5 million reads and 5 million reads associated with these two samples, these two genes, um, and then I went and did 100 million reads and I had 5 million reads associated with one and 95 million associated with the other, those are two very different patterns, right? So just because I had 5 million in the second sample doesn't mean that that's the same level of gene expression that I saw in the first sample. Um, and so we need to correct for, you know, the amount of sampling we're basically doing, for the amount of um, information we're generating. And additionally, um, we need to correct for the size of the targets that we are, sam that we are um, trying to sample. So if I was to um, compare, uh, if I had 5 million reads mapped to two targets, but one of them was one kilobase long and the other one was two kilobase lo okay, kilobases long, which are they actually um, uh, um, being expressed at the same level if what if the sequencing is quantitative? quantitative. Um, and they wouldn't be, right? Because basically I got twice as many reads in the 1,000 if, if, it's, if it's half as long, right? So the other one, I have more, uh, the, I have more ability to break those 2,000 base pair reads into more pieces. So, you know, just because I have 5 million of each doesn't mean they're actually equal expression. So what's really important here is to understand that, you know, it's all relative, right? None of these numbers, when we talk about gene expression, unless you do really careful um, spiking controls uh, have, have much relationship to absolute values. Um, so we're always comparing sort of these relative proportions of read maps. And these are some of the ways that, you know, we can take and, and, and correct these things. So if we think about RPKM, this normalized reads per kilobase per million base pair, so reads per kilobase of the length of the target, right, millions of reads, how much sequencing we did. Here we can see, you know, based upon um, the size of the target and the number of reads that are in this total sample right we can correct and we can see that even though the numbers are pretty different once we correct we can see that they're actually a lot more similar than we thought they were and we can see where this sample might be a little bit different right here we have a, a different replicate as opposed to the other two um, and then if we were to compare that to tpm right what we see here is that um, uh, that if we sum up these values, we actually end up with different magnitudes, which can introduce its own problems. And so a preferred method in this case is to use TPM, which allows us to actually keep a, a, um, a consistent, based upon the calculation, a consistent um, total expected um, count per column. When we think about how we're actually showing the differences between two samples, really what you're doing, and it's way more complex than this, but for our intents and purposes, we're basically just doing what is essentially the same as a t-test, right? We're looking at two, two different entities and we're seeing whether or not their distributions overlap. And if they are far enough apart in their gene expression patterns and what we'd expect by chance, then we would say, okay, they are two, we see differential gene expression. If they overlap in their um, underlying distributions, then we say, oh, there's no real big difference. And like, this is an oversimplification of what's going on because the probability distributions that you're building this thing on are way more complex than what I'm presenting here. But just know it's the same type of principle, right? When we think about significant difference, we're basically doing a means comparison. Um, so, uh, 
one example of um, a transcriptomic study I thought, which was interesting, is there, there's a nice discussion of a study in your uh, text looking at um, how we might understand sort of an alternate physiological state like sleep and how that might affect trans your the genes that are expressed right so sleep is a necessary restorative function um, it's got multiple stages reduced consciousness relaxation quiescence and basically almost everything sleeps like so many things sleep right even simple organisms like flies and worms have sleep right so it's 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 thought to have a very important biological function um, so there were some studies that were done um, looking at sleep in rats and fruit flies and um, basically uh, the fruit fly experiment we saw that they looked at sort of three physiological straight states there was a um, spontaneously awake state there was a spontaneously asleep state and then there was a sleep deprived state and um, one of the things that they did is is why they did it this way is they wanted to also take into consideration the fact that you could have um, you needed to disentangle the role of circadian rhythms on uh, the effect of waking right so that's why they wanted to have this difference this eight hour difference um, between these two because they wanted them to to um, have have this you know awake system um, be disentangled um, from uh, what are the circadian rhythms of fruit flies so we're going to look for an effect of circadian rhythms and also look for an effect of, of waking versus sleeping so they looked at about 10,000 fly genes and um, overall they found greater than 1.5 um, X uh, difference times difference in the level of gene expression among these different groups. Um, what they uh, typically found for um, um, some sleep related genes, which is basically compare, comparing the spontaneous sleep group with the spontaneous awake and the sleep deprived group, they found 12 genes associated with glial processes and lipid metabolism. Um, and glial processes would make sense as uh, we know that sleep is very important for um, the brain um, and its ability to maintain its health. For wakefulness related, we found a lot more genes associated with wakefulness. And so in this case, it was a comparison between the spontaneous awake and the sleep deprived with the spontaneous asleep. So in this case, there were 121 um, immune and other biomolecule metabolism genes that looked to be um, upregulated and expressed during awake time. And this makes a lot of sense too, because we have a lot more activity, we have um, the need for immune protection during that time. And then there was about 130 partially overlapping um, genes that were modulated by the time of day, where um, some of them were more expressed at the 4 p.m. period and other ones were more expressed at the 4 a.m. period. Um, but they were interacting with sleep, uh, be wakefulness and being sleep related as well. Um, overall, though, there were a whole bunch of genes involved in um, um, synaptic plasticity. Um, we saw different types of metabolism being activated in sleep and being in wakefulness. We saw different patterns in transcription and translation. Um, we saw the upregulation of stress responses and different types of cell signaling pathways involved in these two different physiological states, which we would expect, right? So it, it matched well with what we would um, imagine these systems look like. And, you know, it's not just sleep if we look at things like development through time, right? So here is one of those, those expression tables, the heat maps, right? And we've got developmental time of... Um, of flies, right? And they start off and you can see some genes are highly expressed early in development and other ones are not. And as we ex go through develop the various stages of embryonic to larva to pupa to adult development, we can see that there are very distinct groups and sets of genes that are turned on and then turned off um, during development, right? And so we see that, you know, this is about uh, 4,000 genes and we see significant differences in gene expression um, between some of these in some of these stages in all in 300 and almost 35,000 of these genes and the differences are pretty dramatic where we're seeing like a 4x um, difference between the maximum minimum for the large majority of these genes
And, and basically what it's telling us is that, like, you know, we shouldn't expect the same genes to be used throughout our lifetimes. As, as we move through development and through the developmental stages, um, we're going to see different suites of genes be activated for different times of our lives. As an example of how transcriptomics um, actually uh, can be applied in, in another uh, system, something that we've talked a little bit about is sort of this idea of um, placentation and where placentation could come from. So this is a fun study by Oliver Griffith and, and Gunter Wagner looking at um, embryonic implantation and whether or not it evolved from an ancestral inflammatory attachment reaction. Um, and so in this study, they were looking at um, some of the, uh, the comparisons between um, eutherians, which are sort of the modern uh, placentals, marsupials, which have a minor placenta, and monotremes, which have an even more minor placenta. Um, so uh, in this process, um, what they were looking at is sort of um, patterns of uh, late gestation, mid gestation, and uh, non-pregnant um, individuals. And what we see is we see a very distinct pattern of um, uh, each of these s different stages having very different um, gene expression. Um, also indicated here, right, in, again, this process by which we have these different um, uh, 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 gene expression patterns associated with these different um, time points in development. Um, and then we can see sort of like in each of these different stages, there are different groups of, of functional terms that are associated with the, the differences that we see between um, these different stages. And then if we look across uh, different organisms, we can see, you know, comparing uh, uh, the, expre uh, the expression patterns we see in a, in a range of eutherians to um, a placental, we can see that there are um, certain genes that are shared in their gene expression across all of these groups, whereas others that are missing and are, are absent. Uh, and if we look at what these genes are associated with, um, what we can see is by examining these patterns of gene expression, we can see that possum and human actually share this pre-attachment and this attachment inflammation phase, whereas possums move directly to partrition, whereas um, in eutherian systems, we see an anti-inflammatory phase followed by a second inflammation and then birth. So by, by studying these different patterns of gene expression, we can start to understand you know, which, which patterns of expression are associated with some organisms and are not with others. So, uh, I think these are just some, some fun examples of how transcriptomics can be applied. Uh, in the next uh, um, uh, segment, we're going to be talking about um, another part of transcription that's really important, which is um, understanding how epigenetic controls are affecting transcriptional processes.